Welcome to season two of Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. Adrian Fries and Trey Bailey invite you to join them on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as we participate in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. Before we start our show and welcome Dr. Angel Parham, I wanted to remind our listeners that we are a listener-supported podcast. If you're a fan of our podcast, please join us for a very special Patreon-sponsored event. We're hosting a free online listening party with our favorite music professor, Dr. Carol Reynolds, and a rising star cellist, Justin Hall. This musical event will be streamed live on October 22nd at 3 o'clock Central and 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock Eastern and 2 o'clock Central. Enjoy beautiful live music and spirited conversation from a rising young musician and a world-class music professor and guide. Hear a live defense of good music and gain new skills for listening to classical music. And interact with the hosts, myself and Trey, and other supporters of the Classical Education Podcast. If you want a Zoom link to this free event, please email me at beautifulteaching at gmail.com. That's beautifulteaching at gmail.com. Or join our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash classical education. That's patreon.com forward slash classical education. And uh, through our Patreon page, that is how you can financially support our podcast. But this event is a free live event. and You do not have to be a Patreon member to enjoy this event. Simply email me again at beautifulteaching at gmail.com. So on today's show, we are welcoming Dr. Angel Parham. And this episode is on a classical education for all. Angel and I met a few years ago when I worked at the University of Dallas, and we discussed an educational nonprofit program that she founded called Nyanza Classical Community. Nyanza is a classical Christian after-school program that helps to deepen children's education through a curriculum that helps them develop moral imagination and a foundation in cultural knowledge. Dr. Parham is also an associate professor of sociology and a senior fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture at the University of Virginia. Her research and her teaching are inspired by classical philosophies of living and learning that emphasize the pursuit of truth, goodness, and beauty. Dr. Parham is also the co-author of The Black Intellectual Tradition, Reading Freedom in Classical Literature, published by Classical Academic Press this past year. And she's also the president of the Board of Academics Advisors for the Classical Learning Test, the CLT. And if you didn't listen to that podcast yet, that's in season one. We're fans of the CLT. And um, so I'd like to go ahead and start off this episode by asking Angel to share her story about the founding of Nianza Classical Community. Angel, thank you so much for joining us. I know that you're very, very busy. and We really appreciate you taking time to come on the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Adrian. It's just a pleasure to be here um, and a pleasure to be part of this burgeoning um, classical movement and um, love what you're doing with your uh, podcast. So yes, so Nyansa began about seven years ago and it began um, as a partnership between myself and Danielle Bennett Dukes um, when I was still living in New Orleans and we were both homeschooling our children. So we're both African-American women um, who really care not only for our children, but for the larger community that we are embedded in and just both had a real love for classical education. So uh, for me, um, where I was living in New Orleans uh, and we still have our connections in our house there, I go back um, as often as I can. Uh, So the community that, that we were living in, we were connected with our church, which is how we arrived there. The church was given some plots of land post-Katrina to help in revitalizing the area, and our family built a house on one of those plots post-Katrina. So the community is one that, you know, it's, it's 
has a lot of issues struggling with, um, a lot of wonderful people, but also a lot of issues, largely African-American, lower income, working class, a smattering of a few more middle-class people like ourselves. And then our church was located just a few blocks away. And there, there were other families from our church nearby. Um, my neighbors across the street, I would talk to them um, and they had children about the same age. So at this point, I'd say, you know, maybe like seven years old and younger. And I would just go across, you know, kind of just to talk to them, say hi. And they would say, you know, um, what one mother said, my, my son is about to go into third grade and he's just not reading where he should. And I just don't, you know, what what's going on. I, I don't feel like I'm having good conversations with the teachers. And then another mother down the street across from us. Um, we both had kids who were either four or five at the time. Um, I think it was four because she was saying, you know, my daughter goes to this preschool, but I just feel like she's not getting a lot. And they both knew that I was an educator. And so they were just asking for resources, um, you know, and at the same time, here I was sitting across the street, you know, reading this lovely, great literature with my daughters and reading classics, you know, children's classics, and then adaptations of classics like Homer and Shakespeare for young children. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. You know, how, how do I get to sit here and like do all of this with my children and my neighbors right across the street are struggling. Mm -hmm. And then um, Danielle also really had a heart for um, other families in her community that were also not able to um, take time out to homeschool or do classical education. So we came together to co-found um, Nyansa Classical Community, and it was modeled on what we were doing at home. So we had lots of rich literature, we had memory work, um, poetry, Bible, Latin, and that is, you know, so it was modeled on our homeschooling lives. So for six years, um, so Danielle was able to be with us for the first um, couple of years, um, and then she had to turn to other projects, um, but, you know, really had a wonderful impact just kind of setting the trajectory mm -hmm. and the, the mission. Um, so then um, as I was taking over, we met for six years at my church and um, I worked with my college students. I had service learners come um, to help implement the, the program we were doing and it was an after school program. And so that is what we did for the first six years. And then the last couple of years, um, we've had a lot of adaptations with COVID, which I can go into later. Mm -hmm. Tell tell our listeners what the name, and I apologize, I, I did not pronounce it correctly. Nyansa. Nyansa. Is that correct? Nyansa. Tell us about that word and what it means, how it reflects your mission. Yeah. So Nyansa is an Akan word um, from West Africa, which means wisdom. And then we have a logo. If you go to our website, you'll see our logo beside Nyansa Classical Community. And that logo um, is an Adinkra symbol, which is part of a larger Akan symbolic system, which there are many dozens of Adinkra symbols. And each of them is associated with a saying or a proverb. And so the symbol that we have that is Nyansa's logo means the one who does not know can know through learning. Um, so they're both focused on education and wisdom. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I'd like you to share with us how this um, program is having an impact on the families and who's involved. Yes. Okay. So um, I will, I'll break this into kind of two, you know, kind of pre-COVID and post-COVID. Sure. <laughs> so many things are these days. So pre-COVID for the first six years, um, we are centered in New Orleans in the community that I just told you about. And then post COVID, um, I've since moved to Virginia and we have formalized a curriculum and there've been different communities in the US and one now in Uganda who've been using the curriculum. Um, so I'll speak to kind of both of those contexts. So for the first six years, um, these were children um, from families right around me. Um, some of them went to the church, um, some of them didn't. And these are um, families, I would say, who are definitely coming from low-income communities who are 
um, looking for good opportunities for their children, but who don't always have the resources to, to kind of get what they want for their children. Um, so, and at our program, it was all African-American students as well. Uh, uh, so I would visit the homes and, you know, when I was registering the kids and get to know the parents um, and then work with the kids, of course, when they came in. Um, so these are, are often not the kids that we think of when we think of who's reading um, Homer and Shakespeare and so on. Um, but we were able to kind of do this in a way we, we always integrate the the voices and the, the culture of people of color into what we're doing mm -hmm. um, so that the children see how they are part of this larger story. Uh, so that has always been a lot of fun for us to be able to do that. So these are our children who often, you know, in the public discourse, the focus is on, you know, like we just need to kind of crack the whip and, you know, kind of drill them more and more and test them more and more. And, you know, and certainly there's always room for testing. Um, but I fear that sometimes we, we lose um, this sense of wonder and beauty that is also so crucial for education. And so what I loved about um, having this as an after school program for six years was so we would also help them with their homework. Um, but then they would get to go in, you know, at one point we were um, studying the ancient Egyptians and hieroglyphics. Um, we made cuneiform tablets out of clay. Um, we studied Bible stories and had Bible story jeopardy. You know, we would do Latin games with different Latin roots. Uh, we would read Homer, a children's version of Homer's Odyssey, and then um, look at that alongside of African-American artist Romare Bearden's Black Odyssey series, All the which art is just that beautiful. you have is incredibly beautiful. It's so touching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So always, you know, bringing together art and poetry, um, song, games, uh, to really always reinforcing the academics, um, but also giving them a space to breathe, to sink into great story, to act it out, to do artistic work. And so that's where we love to be able to work alongside schools that maybe um, are not able to focus so much on that piece of it. Uh, so so that's, that's kind of a, a little bit of a portrait of our students for those first six years. And Claire, to clarify, most of the schools you're working with are public schools, correct? So yes, those those mm -hmm. first six years they were all public schools. Uh huh. So that, and so you're you're immersing these children in the after school program to experience what a classical school should look like, really. That that is the idea. Yeah. That mm -hmm. is literally the idea is to bring classical schooling and pedagogy to students who are not necessarily getting that where they are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How have the families responded? So they have been really happy, um, in particular when we would have memory work where the kids would go home um, chanting or singing the memory work, they would say, oh my gosh, you know, they're always singing the <laughs> song or, you know, so that was a lot of fun. And then, um, kind of one of our culminating activities in 2019 was the creation of a poetry booklet where um, we had helped the children write haikus based on Greek mythology. And this was put into a booklet by a very talented um, African-American student who's an artist and graphic designer. And she created these beautiful imaginative reimaginings of the Greek gods and goddesses as black and brown images. And the children's poetry was put together with those images. And then um, our students were invited to a local diner called Melba's in New Orleans, where the owner, um, Jane Scott, Jane Wolf, a wonderful, wonderful person, um, she bought 100 copies of this booklet. And our students signed the booklets and then they were given away to patrons at the diner. Um, and, you know, the parents just love this, right? Seeing their children, the center of attention, signing books, you know, like mm. celebrities. And um, it just, it, it really um, 
emphasized, I think, for the children and for the families, the significance of what they'd been doing. Oh, that is a beautiful story. I'm sure, Trey, you're, you have some questions and comments to add to this, too. Yes, uh, Dr. Parham, thank you for being with us, and congratulations on your new position at the University of Virginia. And uh, I'm I'm so uh, delighted to hear about this program that you started, and and it sounds like it's continuing in some form or fashion. And I'd like to I'd like to think about uh, thinking about these families that you're serving. Notably, there are some there are some groups and. Um, collections of, of, of activists that are try, saying that they're wanting to serve these same families, and yet they're saying that um, works like Homer are, are something that don't belong in the classroom. And, and so when I hear that you're uh, bringing Homer uh, into your after-school program, uh, that just strikes me as, as you uh, really sort of uh, swimming up, up up the current, so to speak, against the against the current, or at least what's in vogue. So I, I just love to hear a little bit more about why you chose Homer and and why you believe Homer is important um, for all students and and perhaps um, uh, in particular for for the students and families you're looking to serve. Certainly. Um, well, I, I have to say I'm not original, you know. So I want to to hasten to say there's nothing you know particularly new or novel or brilliant about what I'm doing at all. I, I cannot claim that. Um, I am literally following in the steps of, of great African-American writers, intellectuals, artists who have done the same thing. So this is part of our community. This is not something new. It's not something forced. It's you know, not an effort at um, a kind of whitewashed assimilation. <laughs> like this is this kind of this dialogue with the classics, um, a very creative and fruitful dialogue where something new and beautiful comes out of it is part of the African-American tradition. Um, and so um, particularly following um, emancipation in the 19th century, one of the greatest debates um, that is, is often encapsulated between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois was this debate over what kind of education for the newly emancipated. And so um, Booker T. Washington emphasized much more um, industrial and agricultural education, which there's nothing wrong with that, um, but did not put as much emphasis on the liberal arts. Um, whereas W.E.B. Du Bois um, conceded that, yes, you know, we, we do need people doing the industrial and the agricultural, but he put more of an emphasis on the liberal arts and said, that is also something that's really, really important. Um, and really, he said, you know, we need a, a vanguard of, of African-American leaders who are educated in the liberal arts, who are leaders, who can kind of cast a vision for our community, because, you know, we are, education is something not just to make your daily bread, but it is something that helps you to be fully human. And Anna Julia Cooper, who's writing around the same time, late 19th and then into the 20th century, um, similarly, so she was born in the last few years of slavery and it, at the point of emancipation was about seven years old and was able to get into um, the classical track um, at St. Augustine Normal School in North Carolina. And so she, you know, had to talk her way into that because it was meant for young boys who were supposed to be going into the ministry. Um, but she wanted this kind of education for herself and, you know, really rose through the ranks and became a tutor there, went to Oberlin, um, was a leader at the M Street School in Washington, D.C., um, and a real advocate for um, classical liberal arts. So I am just continuing in that tradition. That tradition has been cut off more or less for the last 100 years. Mm -hmm. um, and not just for us, for all students of all backgrounds. You know, once a certain um, way of thinking about education that is, um, you know, kind of coming out of the progressive era said that, you know, we didn't really need the classics or they weren't democratic enough. Um, so for the last hundred years or so, that tradition has been submerged and it is now kind of 
experiencing happily a time of flourishing. Um, and so in the African-American community, that is just part of our heritage. And as um, more people learn about that, they say, oh, I, I didn't even realize this, but that's why I love history so much, <laughs> right? Because, um, and in my main scholarly work, I do historical work. Um, I'm not a historian, I'm a sociologist, but I do historical sociology um, and do a lot of work on the 19th century. And um, what I see is that so much of what we've been doing, so many, many of the fierce debates we're having now, we have already had this conversation. That's right. <laughs> That's so true. That's true. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your understanding of liberal arts education and why it matters for all people. Some of our listeners are brand new to classical education and they're asking what is classical education because it's becoming a more popular option for parents who are looking for an alternative. So I'd like you to explain to our listeners what, what your understanding of a liberal arts education really is. How is it different and why does it matter for all people? Yeah. Um, so when I think of the liberal arts, there, there are many different ways of thinking about it. Um, if we think about it just etymologically, you know, kind of the origins of the word liberal, it is an education that is freeing. Um, so one that is freeing the mind um, and the spirit to be able to really, to truly flourish. But then you can get into some of the more specifics. Um, and so there we can think of um, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, for instance. Um, so many of our classical schools are organized into those stages. And at the grammar stage, students are focusing, that's where they're sponges. And they can just take in lots and lots of information. Um, so you have a lot of memorization. And memorization's gotten a really bad reputation, I think, um, unfortunately, uh, but the way that I, I prefer to think about it is learning by heart. So what is it that you're storing up in your heart? So what kind of good material do you have from literature, if you're in a faith-based context in scripture that you are storing up in your heart? Because that really helps to shape your mind and your thinking and it's what's stored up in your heart and in your mind that you can then you draw on creatively. And it helps to, to give some scaffolding to your thinking. So at that grammar stage, you know, that is when the children are really memorizing. So for instance, I just went to the closing ceremony of my daughter's classical school. And in the elementary school level, it's called the whole thing is called Ephesians Chapel. This is Regent School of Charlottesville. And what they do is this really beautiful thing where um, the children in the elementary school, first through sixth grades, um, each grade memorizes one chapter of Ephesians. And one after another, so grade one gets up and recites all of chapter one of Ephesians. Grade two gets up and recites all of chapter two of Ephesians, all the way back till sixth grade. Um, and so every year that they're in the school, they're going to be memorizing one of those chapters. Um, and so it builds discipline, memory capacity, and then also, you know, just it makes opportunities to think and talk about scripture. The same thing if you're memorizing great passages of literature. Um, copy work is often something that um, classical schools and homeschools were due where you put a text in front of a child, a, a great text, mm. one that, you know, gets you to reflect and you literally copy it. You're working on handwriting, but you're also really kind of taking in the beauty of the writing. Um, so this is at these very early stages is you're putting the best kind of reading and thinking before children and help, helping them to take it in. Um, then often you'll get the, the logic stage, um, more of a kind of middle school where there is a focus sometimes on literally learning formal logic. Um, and so starting to really understand how arguments are made and what are good arguments. And I can't say enough about how during our, our current climate um, where people are wrestling with what is truth, how important it is to be able to exercise logic. 
So my daughter this year was in seventh grade and had logic as one of her courses at her classical school. And so she would have assignments where she would have to identify advertisements that had logical fallacies in them. Mm -hmm. Um, And then she'd have to explain what is the logical fallacy and what are they trying to do? Um, And so, you know, she would be able to pick things apart as she's seeing them on television, on billboards. She'd say, oh, mom, look at what they're trying to do. But I see through what they're doing, right? So really being able to think for yourself And then at the rhetoric phase um, in high school, um, students are really ready. They've absorbed lots of great material from literature, from the arts, from history and grammar school. They've learned how to construct and see through. (laughs) They've learned how to construct good arguments and see through bad arguments. And then at the rhetoric stage, they are now ready to put all of that into action. and they have um, at, that culminates in mm-hmm. a senior thesis often at many classical schools, which I didn't get a senior thesis until my senior year of college. Um, but I've also been interviewed by some seniors at different classical schools who are interviewing me for their senior thesis. You know, they're doing extensive research and they're putting together a significant paper that is bringing together all of the richness that they have learned in those earlier levels. So. Probably the way that I could boil it down when I think of of liberal arts um, is if you think about um, bringing together the best of literature and history and writing and um, logic and languages, but you're starting all of that in kindergarten. So you're not waiting till they're in college. You are starting that at an age appropriate ways from when they're in kindergarten and you get 13 years K through 12 of that kind of very rich education. Mm-hmm. I think this uh, renewal in classical education that's been going on for um, the last few decades now uh, has just brought about so many good things and has really um, welcomed back into the lives of, of schools and, and uh, families um, these, these great works of literature. Uh, that in some ways were really just being preserved by homeschool moms uh, mm-hmm. uh, because they're being quickly jettisoned from, from the halls of higher academia, as you know, um, mm-hmm. as someone who works in that space. Um, and I think uh, perhaps an ongoing conversation we could have is uh, the ways in which um, Adrian and I are sort of rethinking through um, some of those um, uh, stages and and maybe examining how um, perhaps they're not as hard fast as, as they've been articulated in the past and, and that maybe the way that we um, progress through them uh, or, or move in and out of them or uh, enter into them as modes uh, is, is another way to think about it. And so that's a conversation that uh, we should probably um, uh, pick up at a later time. I want to circle back around to Homer and, and, and get your thoughts on uh, why you think Homer is so needed? Uh, why why do why do young students need Greek mythology of all things? Why Greek mythology? So so Greek mythology and Homer. Okay, um, and, and of course you need the mythology to understand Homer. Um, so I, I think the 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 easiest answer for students um, in any kind of Western society is because Homer is everywhere. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, so just just being purely practical, um, if you want to really fully understand um, much of Western literature and, mm. and um, you're going to need to have some kind of basic um, understanding of Homer. Uh, so, and, and let's, for example, um, I am thinking of two Black writers who, if you were going to read them and you hadn't read Homer, you would just not be able to understand them. Um, so one is Toni Morrison and her book, um, Song of Solomon. Mm-hmm. If you have not read the Odyssey, you can still read Song of Solomon, but you are going to have be skimming at the very surface of that book 
you're going to be skimming at the surface. Hmm. It, you know, I've read, I've read that book several times and every time I read it, I have deeper, you know, I, a deeper dive into it. And, you know, um, but yeah, Circe's in there, the Cyclops is in there, the whole sense of journey and what is home is in there, but it's within this um, African-American context. Um, and so y- you would just be missing all of those levels. Um, another is Derek Walcott, um, who is a West Indian writer. And so he um, wrote Omeros. And he in Omeros, um, it, he says that he named it that because that was the Greek form of Homer, which he hadn't known. Um, and he saw these resonances between um, the um, ar- archipelagic nature of much of the Caribbean and Greece as an archipelago and being both being very seafaring. Um, and, and he also was kind of looking in Omeros it is, you know, recast within this, you know, kind of West Indian post-enslavement situation where it's, again, kind of the African diaspora grappling with what is home. Uh Um, And so it's put into that particular historical and cultural context, but he's very much drawing on Homer's odyssey, um, right? And, you know, so these are, are just two examples, but of course, you know, much of Western literature, um, American writers, European authors, if you have no familiarity at all with Homer, you're, I mean, you can read literature, but to what extent are you really grasping it? Yes, I think that's quite right. Now, earlier in our conversation, you mentioned that your students learn uh, to sing and to chant. And this is this is something that is that is certainly a part of the the classical tradition, and we see uh, its a, its effectiveness, uh, sort of in that sense. But there's also just something that's just human about chanting. I mean, we see it across culture and across time, and you know sometimes we chant very beautiful things. Um, I'm thinking of the the Gregorian chants, for example. Uh, sometimes we chant silly things, like with our children, uh, you know, ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. And then sometimes uh, we get together and we chant uh, very dangerous things, like, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. Um, do, do, do you see the danger there? And and why do you think people are tempted to chant things like that? And, and what can we do to sort of, um, let's say, re-enchant their imaginations? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I think there's there's something about the musicality of chant, you know, that that enchants us literally. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I think it does matter what you're listening to, what you're memorizing, what you're saying. Um, you know, I think the idea of, of Western stuff has got to go. Um, so, so there, the critique has been that, and and I don't think it's an uh, an entirely unwarranted critique that you know let's look at the the history of of western expansion across the world through imperialism colonialism um genocide of native americans um you know who've been just mercilessly um taken out of the country the landscape uh you know there's a lot of things that are not good (laughs) and so the i and for so long the history and the voices of people of color were really not respected and were not part of the curriculum um, in any meaningful way. Um, and so the the issue was that, well, we would like to have more diverse voices. We would like to have a history that tells more of the whole story and not so much only the story of the victors. And so there were very good reasons for that critique, very good reasons for it. I think where I differ is instead of overturning everything, (laughs) right? Um, Like I said, you you know, I mean, African-American writers and intellectuals are still part of this Western tradition. Um, And so, and they have built on that tradition. So it's, it's like trying to cut off part of oneself as a form of self liberation. Mm-hmm. Like it, it doesn't work. Like if, if if I try to cut off my leg, 
um, because I don't like the way it looks, that's not going to liberate me at all. Um, so I think the critique, I, I certainly understand and agree with the critiques of the, the worst parts, enslavement, colonialism, and so on. That critique was absolutely necessary. We absolutely do need more diverse voices. But where I differ is let's bring in the voices that were already there that had not been heard. Let, let's see where many diverse peoples have already been in conversation, have built on um, the best aspects of the Western tradition. But at the same time, we can't ignore the, the parts that have not been so great. And so then we have to find ways of teaching that history. And I'm a big proponent of teaching through primary documents. We have to find ways of teaching that history that allow the past to speak without it kind of just taking over as everything is bad, right? right. A way to teach that history, and I, I love primary documents because they speak. And then we we don't have to impose our own agenda on it. They speak very loudly for themselves. Right. And this is why when we're going to put the primary documents before our students, it's so important for them to understand how to identify logical fallacies and how to have civil discourse and conversations. And this is what should be happening in a classical school is helping students learn the arts of communication so that not only communication in speaking, but in listening and in thinking. And I love that uh, that classical education does that for our students so that then they can approach those original source documents and have a really good conversation about it and get to the heart of the truth behind the message. So I, th I think you're right. And I, I, I'm guessing, and I, I haven't read your new book yet, but I'm guessing some of what you're saying is at the core of the message of your new book with Dr. Anika Prather. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. So how, how do you think this book is going to help the classical education community at large? Well, you know, only the classical community can decide <laughs> that. But I guess my hope um, is that it will provide um, resources and an approach for thinking about how to bring in more diverse voices and perspectives that are already part of the tradition. So that, that is my hope, that it, it becomes something where people can see, oh, this is already part of the tradition that right. we're teaching, but maybe it's just part that we weren't as familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, and so that it just provides more resources why, for looking why, at that. Why so that, do you that think that we aren't as familiar with it? What happened? Very good question. Um, you know, I, I think... You know, as I said, there was this large debate around um, African American educators about what kind of education, mm -hmm. and there was a similar debate, you know, amongst mainstream educators um, at the beginning of the 20th century with the rise of the progressive era. And so classical education in general dropped off of the agenda. Mm -hmm. But um, Black intellectuals in particular, just because of, you know, their status in society, we're never going to be at the center of the mainstream to be able to determine, you know, what the mainstream curriculum was going to be. Um, so I think that's part of where things got lost is classical education in general um, was submerged right. yeah. um, and overturned. But then Black intellectuals who were doing all of this brilliant writing and thinking um, were also, even if it had continued, I'm not sure that they would have been as included. And I think that's that's just the the, the structure of our country um, where there has been racial inequality, mm -hmm. frankly. Um, and so those who are on the margins, you know, they they just often are not paid attention to in the same way. Um, and so sociologically, one way to think about that just is just in terms of networks, right? Who you know, sure. who you're yeah. familiar with. And you will tend to choose and put at the center those who you know and who you're familiar with. And those who you are not as familiar with, just, you know, 
it may not be even against them, but they're just not at the center of your world. And so they're just not going to be the ones who are invited into the conversation. And I think that happens with any kind of marginalized people. I, I think you're right. In fact, um, years ago, I was working at Responsive Ed, a big charter school uh, network in Texas, and they have lots of classical schools, I think over 20 now. And I was working as the director of uh, classical methods, and I was writing curriculum. And so what I was doing with, with my uh, colleague was looking at the core knowledge sequence, which they use for history. It's a great sequence, okay? And in fifth grade, they were studying the Civil War and Reconstruction era. And I was tasked with writing an English curriculum that would complement the core knowledge history program. And it was a big learning lesson for me. I had to dive in and do research. Who am I going to include in fifth grade literary lessons for Civil War and Reconstruction Era? And Angel, I'll tell you, I learned a lot that I had never read before. I read W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, du Bois. I, I always say Du Bois, but it's Du Bois. I hear you say yes. it. Okay. Good to know. I'm learning how to pronounce things from you today. And I read uh, some of Booker T's stories, and I had the kids... It was interesting because while I was writing these lessons, I was learning and I was noticing. I was like, wow, these two guys were really at odds with each other. But I tried to bring like passages that were fifth grade level in and pull key parts of things they were saying. And then I would have the students read both parts and then have a discussion about what they noticed was going on here. And then I had them reading... Um, there were several others. We, we looked at some Winslow Homer paintings from the Reconstruction era. We read some poetry, um, emancipation. Um, who's the gentleman in Florida that um, started the NAACP? Johnson? I think I it's John. Uh, yeah, he, he just did a wonderful, and he, he did a wonderful um, poem that we, I had them compare with a poem that was from uh, that had been written by a slave. There was no name to it. It was just, mm. it was very eye-opening to me. And I felt like, wow, this is, this is really important. And the mm. literature was beautiful. And I'll tell you what I think amazed me. I, when I was reading Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery to, to put into these lessons, oh my goodness, he had such a beautiful heart as a child. And his longing to learn how to read and the hard work ethic that he had to get himself to go to school at like nine o'clock at night, you know, I thought, wow, you know, this love of learning is something we're all born with. Mm -hmm. We want to learn. And his story, I think, is really important to show adults, to remind adults, especially teachers and parents, what we're born with innately, we want to know how to think, communicate, and relate with the, people, the world around us. That's what we want to do. And somehow along the way, whatever we've developed in the school models that we have today, the love of learning, the desire to learn has, is being killed. Because by the time a student gets to second or third grade, they hate school. And, you know, you hear it, you go to the grocery store and it's summer vacation and the cashier looks at your child and says, aren't you so glad it's summer break? You know, it's like, are they supposed to hate school? You know, and, and, and looking at his story, I cried when I was reading it about this is the love of learning that we want all of our students to have. We don't want them to lose it. So I, in the work I do, I'm always going back to What's best for the child? And how can we give them an education that makes them hang on to the love of learning and never lose it? Because Booker T never lost it. Mm -hmm. And it's like he wasn't ruined by a system. He went to school voluntarily. <laughs> and it, it's a beautiful story. And I, it, break, it broke my heart as I kind of read later, like where he was going. And I understood the logic. But uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, he, he, he understood it too. And I, I was going on that side of it. I was like, okay, you know, you got to have the classical education. You got to have both, you know, it's not one or the other. I think it's all. And we talked to like um, Chris Hall about the common arts. I mean, right. this is yeah. something the common arts are missing in our classical schools and we need to bring all of it in. It's 
we're humans and we're, we should be growing food. We should be making musical instruments. We should be playing, but we should also be formally having these, the formal seven liberal arts. It should all be together. And I, I kind of thought that, boy, if you could just create a school that was the philosophy of both Booker T and W.E.B. Du Bois and bring it together, you've got the perfect school. I you know? agree. That, that would be lovely. <laughs> Something that I appreciate you about you, Dr. Parm, is uh, you you strike me as someone who is is so wanting to work within a tradition uh, <laughs> to to tie yourself back to something. Uh, let, let, let me let me rephrase that to reclaim something that is rightfully yours, right? And 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 then and then you you try to figure out ways to give that back to other people who um, are are being denied it or um, or don't even know that it's theirs to claim, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, in that sense, uh, I think um, you know your your work can um, in in one way just just be an encouragement to say, hey, this is something worth doing, and um, and and there's a seat at the table for everybody. And we're all going to approach this with with different backgrounds and different um, experiences, but um, there is truth, and we can we can find it, and if we seek it, and we can live in it, and these stories will will help us know how to do that as good humans. So I just want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. thanks thanks for the kind words. Um, yeah, I think it is absolutely true that I want I want. Um, particularly African American people, but all people, um, to know that this is for them. You know that there, there's, there's no reason to feel that this is not for you. Um, and I, I take that in in many ways. You're you're quite right, um, Trey. That I, it means a lot to me to be tied to traditions to find my my footing in traditions. Um, I take that even with my love of classical music. You know, um, I've played the cello for almost 40 years and um, continue to play in ensembles um, as a, a committed amateur. Um, but, you know, I think about um, Joseph Boulogne. Um, he's also called the Le Chevalier de Saint-Georges, who was born in the, the French West Indies um, in the 18th century to a French father and an um, African mother was taken to France and subsequently became, you know, a fencing champion and a violin virtuoso and composer. Uh, you know, so he is an example um, amongst many others, other Black people in classical music who, you know, people just don't know about them, don't think about them, but they're there. Um, there is a woman named Giovanna Joseph in New Orleans um, who is bringing back, um, it's uh, called Opera Creole, I believe is the name of the organization. And she um, puts on, she's an opera singer, puts on pieces that were created by people of color in um, 19th century New Orleans. You know, um, so we are everywhere in many different traditions, but people just need to know about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. I think in the world of higher education, and Adrian, I'm watching the clock. I know we need to uh, move towards our closing question here. Um, but there, there's there's so many good things to explore, so we should probably just have a part two. Um, but just as a bit of a teaser, uh, it seems to me that uh, in the world of higher education, because a lot of the things that end up happening in the classroom uh, in, in the lower schools are the product of the work that's going on in higher education, right? And so... You know, we have this this history of the development of something like Black Studies, for example, and and what I would be interested in, in in encouraging is taking a page right out of the tradition, right? Looking at how you know the the classics have been studied in terms of you know having a, a deep knowledge of context and original languages, and you know what. Uh, let's see those um, colleges and in those departments um, going back to language requirements like Swahili and Fulani or even French to read Algerian and Moroccan literature or Portuguese. You know, I mean, if we don't have that, then we're just going to continue to lose 
uh, texts and and stories from the past because we can't read them or because they're That's not true. being they're not being considered in 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 the the halls of academia. That's true. So. I think you're you're absolutely right on that. Um, so I've been in higher education for a very long time, and I recall when we were redoing our um, core curriculum at my previous university, we had this whole argument on languages, precisely on what you're talking about. And I fought really hard for languages to say, you know, we need, we should have at least two years of a language, at least. Um, that's not gonna get you fluent, but that will at least give you a foundation. Um, and I think where we are at a disadvantage, and this is what happens when you're at the center of power, right? We're at a disadvantage because everyone knows English, just about, mm -hmm. because they feel like they have to know English to survive in this world. Yeah. We are at the center of power. We don't have to learn everyone else's language. Mm -hmm. We can go almost anywhere and operate in English. And while that feels good and comfortable, it is a gross disadvantage that we don't feel pushed to learn more. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Swahili. So uh, my math thesis was in Tanzania, and um, I interviewed people with a research assistant in Swahili. So Swahili was my first foreign language um, before I switched to work in Haiti, and now it's French and Haitian Creole. So I have a great respect for languages. Um, you know, ironically, um, in terms of classical education, I don't have Greek or Latin, um, but you know, I'm still trying to solidify French and Haitian Creole, and I've already been through Swahili, so like there's <laughs> there's a limit to how much I can do. But yes, um, if you don't have languages, you can't fully explore another culture and its literature. That's and um, I really appreciate having been able to travel and speak with people in their language rather than asking them to speak in my language. Great. You know, before we end with our closing question, I would like to circle back around and just give you a chance to let our listeners know how they can support your work with Nianza if 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 you need volunteers or staffing opportunities. And then Trey will end with our closing question. Well, thanks so much. Yes. Um, so the last two years with COVID, we've taken to write up um, 20 week curricula. We have a lower school and an upper school version. It's humanities based. And we've had some wonderful partners pilot it. And so now what we're looking for is we are looking for places um, at the elementary, um, middle and high school levels that would be interested in actually using it in their communities, either in public schools or um, community centers or churches. Um, so people can reach out to me. I have sample curricula that I can send them and we'd just be really happy to have more partners to actually use it. Um, I just had a, an exciting meeting with um, a Rafiki school in Uganda this morning where there are three wonderful teachers there who've been using our curriculum this year. And it was just such a delight to hear how the children there in Uganda have been benefiting from that. Um, and I just love to see more and more of that. So that, I would say that would be great. You know, if there are people who would like to partner with us by um, uh, being a liaison in your community with others who might like to use it. Okay, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, they can email me um, at angel.adams.parham at gmail.com um, or they can visit Nyansa Classical Communities website. Um, and when they do that, there is actually a, um, it's, nyansaclassicalcommunity.org. Maybe I can just put that in the chat for you. Um, but when they do that, there is actually an option to get in touch with me. Okay. So either way. Very okay. Good. Dr. Parham, we'd ask that you leave our listeners with uh, one more gift, and that is uh, either a book recommendation, uh, a title that you wish you had read earlier in your life, um, or a quote uh, that that has um, really stuck with you and has has informed the way you uh, the way you think about living the good life. Let's say. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, 
when you'd originally asked me about this, it was a, a book that I wish I had read earlier um, in life. And so the book that I wish I had read earlier is Plato's Republic. Uh, I only read that as an adult post PhD um, because sadly I did not receive a classical education. <laughs> and then when I read the Republic, I thought, oh my goodness, I, I can't believe I've never read this. Um, when I was in middle school, I created a society called Arlandia. And in Arlandia, I was trying to make a better society. And I just think if I had had the Republic, it just would have been something I would have loved to just have as part of my thought world and, you know, kind of philosophizing and thinking about what makes for the good society and the good life. Um, I think as a young girl, I really would have loved that. That's good. Thank you, Angel. This was a really great conversation. I'm so happy to have had this time with you. Thank you. It was a pleasure speaking with both of you. Thank you so much for listening. We invite you to experience the art of teaching through interactive learning communities at our Patreon page. Visit patreon.com forward slash classical education. Also, be sure to join the conversation on our Facebook community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. We are a listener supported podcast, so your support makes this podcast possible. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once wrote, well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be, in a few words, this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know, best of all, what it is to behave under it, as in the presence of a Father who is in heaven.